This is lecture three of ECE 2305. Okay. So in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to talk about transmission terminology. There's like you know a few concepts that you should be aware of in terms of how um, um, you know information is conveyed from terminal A or the transmitter to terminal B, which could be a receiver or many receivers. Right? We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll then talk about frequency domain representation. So this, you actually learn in 2311 and 2312, signals 1 and signals 2. But we're going to go in a little bit of this. There'll be a tiny bit about math, OK? A little bit of math, I promise. Nothing overwhelming. And then last but not least, this is something that just you know, makes my heart race, is electromagnetic spectrum. And I'll talk a little bit about electromagnetic spectrum. And this is actually a big, 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 big thing. It's lots of money. You wouldn't believe how much money is in this thing. But I'll get to it when, w at the end of this lecture. Um, also, you might be wondering, where is this covered in the course textbook? I believe it's pages 72 to 84. All right? So you're gonna, there are some terms I'm not bringing up, like you know, what is periodic versus aperiodic. Though there are a few definitions like that. But I'm going to touch upon sort of the key points from those pages. So first, so in terms of transmission technologies, the first thing that comes up is the medium, right? And again, it's not the TV show. It's actually how does the information get conveyed from one computer to another computer, from one wireless terminal to another wireless terminal. So the terminology that's used in your book, and just intuitively, you have something called guided medium and unguided medium. So the guided medium is something like your Ethernet cable or the coax cable to your TV set, or the fiber optic cable that connects, let's say, two computers together. It real, what guided means is that your information, the energy, is channeled down a specific conduit. In this case, a medium could be glass. It can be copper. It can be some sort of material. But the energy, the signal, is conveyed down that and nowhere else, right? Which makes me wonder, like, you know, you see wireless under unguided medium. That's not quite true. Wireless can also be guided. So you have something like, for instance, earlier today I was talking with somebody about millimeter wave technology. And what is millimeter wave technology? It's a pencil beam of electromagnetic energy that's from one directional antenna down to another one. Why do I know about this? Because many, many moons ago, when I was at University of Kansas in 2006, we, we had this project that dealt with millimeter wave. It's extremely high frequency, 70 to 90 gigahertz. And what happens is we wanted to see how viable that was over seven miles. Okay? And so we had this tall building in University of Kansas on a hill. So Kansas is not completely flat. There are a few mountains there. And what happens is on top of the res hall, we had an antenna. Seven miles away, we found a nice farmer who had a 70-foot tall grain silo. We put the antenna on the other end. And what happens is you could be a few feet next to that transmission, and you wouldn't even know it was there. The energy is very much projected in just one little pencil beam to the receiver. All right? Unguided, on the other hand, implies that your energy is essentially all over the place. If you're transmitting, other people can hear you. Right? Which also, you might wonder, with things like copper and stuff, they do emanate. They do leak a little bit. Nothing's perfectly shielded. So, but in general, what happens is if you have an antenna, and it's uh, what's considered omni or nearly omnidirectional, energy is going around, and several people can pick it up, not just the one. The next thing is connectivity. And this also ties to um, things like guided and unguided mediums. Like you have point-to-point -point connectivity, the direct link. right? So if you take two laptops and you connect an Ethernet cable between the two, right, and you have just file transfer service between those two guys, that's a direct link. There's no intermediate stages. You only have the two guys sharing that information and no one else. Multipoint, on your hand, means lots of people are enjoying that information, that you'll have more than one device, uh, more than two devices that are participating in that information exchange. Last but not least is the communication flow. And this is pretty cool. I forgot who, there was someone here that has a ham radio. You? 
Okay, so you have a ham radio. How many people here are hams? Hams, so one. Anyone else? Hams? Hams, raise, raise your hand tall. Woo! No? Okay, what's your call sign? KC3BIU. KC3BIU. Okay, I'll remember that. KB1WPB. I was five letters away from WPI. Boom! <laughs> Close! <laughs> Close. So what happens is, um, like for instance, like with, uh, with, with like, you know, maybe not ham radios, but definitely with things like walkie-talkies and such, like, you know, different wireless technologies have different modes of exchanging information. You have simplex, like a TV broadcaster, right? Information goes out, but sure as heck does not go back to a TV broadcaster, right? Like, I hate this episode of Seinfeld. You can't tell the TV transmit tower that. It's just one way. And then what happens is you have things like half duplex, which means that only one direction of communications is enabled at any given time. So like the ham radio, like, hello, can you read me over? And, or like, you know, Family Guy, I think, had that episode too, right? The walkie-talkie. You have to end everything with over, over, you know. Um, so that's pretty much like only one direction is active at any given time. And then finally, full duplex is like your telephone, right? You can talk simultaneously. It's like, oh, 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 like everyone's talking and you can't hear anything whatsoever. So this is a terminology that a lot of folks use with respect to wireless links. So in any sort of communication link, which direction does the information flow and does it, is it dependent on the technology? So TV, definitely, it's simplex. And walkie-talkies and stuff is the half duplex. That might also come up in cases where you have limited channel capacity. You only have one channel and your transmissions need to share that in each direction. And then finally, the duplex. Okay, so terminology, so those are kind of the basic terminologies behind transmit, transmitting, but I really want to get sort of deep into the actual physics behind communication. And so at the core of anything communication is the sine function, the sine wave, okay? So in a, in a communication system, so let's look at sine waves. We know there's an amplitude, a phase, and a frequency. You might say, Okay, um, maybe you guys saw it in ECE 2010, maybe you saw it in high school physics, but let, let's, let's, actually, let's actually draw that. Ah, draw time, yay! Because this is going to be re -impor really important. We're going to see this several times in today's lecture. And I know that we're, we're having a shorter lecture than before. So. so what happens is a sine wave looks like this. So over time, what I've got is a sinusoidal signal that looks like this. It has an amplitude A. It has a period T. Okay? And the frequency essentially is the rate of change of that signal. It's basically one over the period. How many of these undulations happen in unit time. The last one is called phase. And phase, what happens is suppose we have something called zero time. This is our reference, right? Phase just talks about how much your signal, your sign signal is, like because usually a sign signal has an aside. A sign signal starts at zero and has one full period and ends here at two pi. And so notice that here, these zero crossings and such, they're, like this guy's actually offset by a certain amount. So what the phase does, what the phase does is it describes how much advanced or delayed my sine function is from its reference, okay? So these three physical properties are king. The phase, how much my waveform is advanced or behind the reference. Its amplitude, how tall, how much amplitude, like how much, en like how much of that signal, how, how tall it is or how small it is from zero volts. And then last but not least, its frequency. Because this guy has a lower frequency then say this guy. And then, of course, we also have this guy. Okay, as you can see, I'm a great drawer. 
And this is all going to come in really handy when we try to actually transmit information, which I'll show in a few minutes. Discard. OK, so that's a sign. So everyone's cool with sign, right? Sign and sign we trust. OK. <laughs> so what ends up happening? There's a, there was a French mathematician dude named Fourier. And again, this, if any of you have taken 2311 or 2312, this should be like screaming, like most of the course is about Fourier. If not, take 2311, 2312. You're going to learn everything about Fourier. What's so special about Fourier? Fourier was a very, very smart French mathematician. There are other French mathematicians as well. But Fourier, what he figured out is within certain constraints and conditions, any any, any, any waveform, any signal can be created by a weighted sum of sines, also cosines. Cosines are just out of phase with sines, right? Any combination of sines and cosines with different frequencies, harmonically related frequencies. So let's say you have one sine function with frequency f. Oh, now I'm going to add another sine function to it with 3f, three times the frequency, maybe half the amplitude. I'm going to add another sine function with 5f, the frequency, so even more indolations and another type of amplitude. What he figured out is he figured out you can characterize any waveform using a large combination of weighted sines and cosines with harmonically related frequencies. So you might wonder, what do I mean by harmonically related? There's a base frequency, f, and all other sines and cosines are based off integer multiples of those f's. So they, they are like this, and then they just get faster and faster and faster by integer multiples. And that's really powerful stuff. So what ends up happening in your text, like exactly, how? I should have put in like really bold, blinky letters, but LaTeX does not have that capability. But Let's actually draw. Well, your book actually does a decent job. I'm actually kind of surprised um, in doing that. So what they did is they said, suppose you have this frequency. So suppose you have sine. Oh, sorry for the math. <laughs> and then you have something 2 pi f of t. And so you have, whoo. Suppose I also put amplitude, right? So. What we see is there's zero phase. It starts at zero. That's t. It has an amplitude a, right? And then, let's say I want to make a really shoddy looking square wave. Really shoddy, right? So a square wave is something that looks like, like a square. It looks like teeth with a few missing. So let's suppose, so just in case. There we go. So square wave. Have to put the aside just in case. So that's a square wave, or a bunch of them. So I want to get that. And I'm going to try and do that with a combination of these different harmonically related sine functions. So what do I do? To that, I'm going to add. Sometimes this is playing music. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to add something that's 1 30 amplitude and, so let's say 1 3rd A, sine 2 pi 3 F of T. So it has three times the frequency and still zero phase. So notice that the ups and downs, the periods are smaller. The frequency at which those ups and downs occur, the peaks and the valleys occur, is three times as much than compared to waveform above. And when you add the two together, what do you get? What you get is approximately, right? And should be like that. So what happens is 
we get the start. Start of square wave. What ends up happening is that if then I add another, another sign to it, let's say um, another, like let's say one fifth a sine two pi five f t. So now it's five times the base frequency, the fundamental frequency of my sine on top. I'm gonna get actually even nicer, smoother tops and uh, like you know the plateau on top here, bottom here and then a sharper transition to get something that looks like my reference, my square wave over here. So that's what Fourier analysis really boils down to in 2311, 2312, is that everything can be decomposed into a collection, a sum of these sine waves. Why is this important for us? This is not 2311, 2312. Oh, no. <laughs> you would be correct. What happens is, why is this important? <coughs> because what happens is, for let's say something like wireless comms, okay? So wired, it's kind of boring. Because it's guided, wired comms, what ends up happening is, the chances of people interfering with each other is pretty much at a minimum. So the cable that you get, the cable TV, or whatever, whatever sort of electromagnetic energy that's propagating through that wire, through that guided medium, it's really not interfering with anyone outside the guided medium. Wireless on your hand, very different story. There's great battles happening right now as we speak with the FCC. So that's a federal regulator here in the US. So in addition to like, you know, saying rules about, um, you know, what can be put on TV and censorship and all that, they're really, their primary purpose is to make sure that everybody plays nice when they send out wireless or electromagnetic emissions. Any electronic device that you have on you probably has something that has a little FCC and maybe like this has been certified to be compliant with whatever chapter or part that the FCC put out there as a document. So what happens is all of us are trying to sort of transmit with each other, even if it's unintentional, but not interfere with each other. And you would be surprised what people would do. Like for instance, there's a blog online several weeks ago that I was reading, and the guy was a little bit uh, off his rocker, but one thing that he did say is that there's a pirate radio station, FM radio station here in Worcester, that I think uh, broadcasts about a mile in all directions and stuff. And I really just wanted to go and find this pirate radio station, like next to Elm Park. And what happens is, who was he interfering with? There was a radio station from Boston, right? And what would happen theoretically if the Boston radio station knew that he was being interfered with, would call the FCC, would do some due diligence and say, hey, I think the radio station's actually located in this building and it's on this frequency and it broadcasts at these times a day. The FCC would come with their white truck with all the electronics in the back and then they have the power to say cease and desist or, you know, bad things happen, right? You go like federal penitentiary. Oh, maybe not. not. Not that bad. You'll get fined. But what happens is it's a Boston radio station. They're not, they don't care so much about the Worcester market, so nothing happens. So, you know, if you guys have some free time, try and find that uh, pirate radio station. Anyways, I digress. Why is this important? The reason why this is important is because when we talk about wireless communications, so a lot of you were like wondering, so that phi layer, how, how does it broadcast information uh, to the network and to, let's say, other routers and the like? And this is how. So remember I was telling you guys about the sign, right? And here's zero. So we know that there's some sort of phase offset. We know this guy has an amplitude and this guy has a period, and one over the period gives us the frequency. What happens if I told you, how does wireless communication signals, let's say that digital data from your web browser then goes all the way down to your Wi-Fi NIC, your little Ethernet card, and you want to send it to, where's that Wi-Fi access point? Over there. So the way it works is that you would basically have every, let's say, your, your data, like 
let's say every t seconds, let's suppose we choose a period. So every period, every period, I can transmit at a different amplitude. Um, yeah, like that. I'm a really bad drawer. But let's say this is amplitude 1, amplitude 2, amplitude 3. Suppose I send a sine wave, but every t seconds, I skew or modify its amplitude or its frequency. Some people, what they do instead is every t seconds, let's say you have this, then you have this, then you have something really long or something like that. And so let's say that's frequency 1, frequency 2. That almost looks like frequency 1. So I'll say frequency 1. Or to phase, there's phase shifts. What happens is your transmitter and your receiver both know what this means. Every t seconds, if your radio picks up an intercepted signal and has amplitude A1, it means a specific type of data. It could be a binary pattern, 1101, right? And then if it receives another amplitude value, it'd say, oh, it's this other binary pattern. So we call that amplitude modulation, but it's different than um, blah, 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 blah. It's different than, let's say, AM radio and stuff. So, it's a, so it would be a digital form of um, uh, communications, but we used amplitude in order to convey digital data, the ones and zeros. The other guy here, the frequency equivalent, we use the change in frequency every t seconds to convey a binary pattern. And we can also use phase. But why is this all important? Because what ends up happening is that we, what we do is that across frequency, so now f, starting at zero frequency, going on all the way to the hundreds of gigahertz and beyond, to light frequencies. Every signal is given its own sine wave to transmit across. We call that a carrier frequency. So you might wonder, like FM radio, where the heck did they get those numbers from? 91.5, the bear, you know? So where did they get those numbers? 91.5 megahertz. And then if you notice, they're 0.2 megahertz spaced out so they don't interfere with each other. AM channels, I'm not sure how many people listen to AM, but AM channels work in very much the same way. Wi-Fi works very much the same way. Wi-Fi is 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz, and there are 12 or 13 channels, but only three non-overlapping ones at different frequencies. Why is this possible? Because if you transmit at a different frequency, it is possible for your radio at the other end to just pull out that frequency and reject everything else. They're orthogonal to each other, all right? So that's why electromagnetic spectrum is so hot. So on a finishing note, actually, what I'll do is I'll post it online. There's a chart that the US and other governments around the world allocate all spectrum for all wireless applications. And take a look at how it's allocated. It's insane. So with that. That is lecture three of ECE 2305. Yes.